Okay, hello everybody. My name is Lara Baxley and I am the Academic Senate President and I am very excited to present Bailey today. Uh, Bailey will be talking about sexual identity from centric margins. Um, the intersection between identity development and identity politics has been on the forefront of Bailey Dressler's academic inquiry. Self-representation and agency continue to find their way into the topics she teaches in her pedagogical approach. Bailey earned her bachelor's degree in social science from the University of California, Berkeley. Her master's degree from Antioch University is in psychology. So please welcome Bailey. Hi, friendly faces. Well, I was telling Lara that there's just something really nice about having this colleague connection or just um, student faculty connection in this kind of arena. So I'm really glad to be here. I'm excited to share this information with you. And the way I present is pretty organic. I'm going to stick to the PowerPoint for just flow, but I do want you to stop me if you have questions because it's going to get a little fluid and loosey-goosey as we talk about sexual identities. I emphasized identities because of the fluid um, nature of, of what that is, and I'm going to break that down a little bit later. The subtitle, From Center to Margins, is, is looking at, uh, first, how the center, meaning the way our society has constructed what we think is sexual identity um, in mainstream views to the more marginalized but yet very realistic, real lived experiences. So center means mainstream and margins is just referring to those that are less visible, those that get targeted by oppression, um, those that are not written about equally in our history books, in our psychology books, until very recently. Okay, so let me get my, my dual action. All right. So how many social scientists do we have in this room or people who are familiar with this concept of social construction? Raise your hand. Yes? Okay, all right. So um, we're going to look at this concept of social construction um, and its impact on, cognitive, uh, on, co on cognition and behavior as it relates to sexual identity. So first, let me talk about sexual or social constructions. Think of them as ideologies that are fundamental, grounded in um, the way we frame our thinking, the way we make laws, the, the way we hold marriages, what we think is normal. That's a social construction. And um, the institutions, the customs, whether it's the laws again, the mar marriage ceremonies, the rites of passage, or the language, it it's, reflects these kinds of thinking about sexual identity that I want to unpack. Um, and it reinforces what's perceived as normal. Um, it also, because of that, reflects the society's priorities and focus. So a real common explanation that's been used is looking at uh, the example of how native Inuit or Alaskan indigenous people use the word um, or have, have vocabulary for the word ice. Now, I'm a native Californian. I don't know ice. It's wet. It's white. It's cold. But if you ask somebody from an Inuit culture, they're going to have all kinds of words that reflect the special nuances in ice that they understand that I don't, that I don't even see. I just see white, cold stuff. Um, it's similar with, uh, I love to use this because it's my culture, Yiddish. It's a bastard tongue of Hebrew, German, and some other languages in Europe. The focus on the Inuit is ice because they live in it, they breathe it. It's a part, so much a part of their world. Did you know that a major part of Yiddish has a dozen probably plus words for the word um, crazy, neurotic? Now we have crazy, neurotic, screwed up, but I, I won't, but I could name, rattle off 
you know, for toots, for bludgeoned, um, for, for clamped, all of that, and there's more. So where the, the social um, focus is, is often reflected in language. So I'm bringing this up now because when we in this culture, ours, talks about gender, we talk about in a very binary way. Males, females, boys, girls. And we grow up with those laws and institutions that reinforces that thinking. The problem is, in reality, not everyone falls in either categories. And so their lived experiences, those realities are not understood or recognized or they're, they're harassed because of that. So I want to delve a little bit deeper into um, the social construction of gender and sexuality um, in our binary way because it's often sort of forgotten. It's, social constructions are not often uh, examined. We just live it. You know, we don't think twice. Um, when I say we, I'm just going to say a percentage of this because I know statistically, will not think twice when we fill out a power, uh, password, passport uh, document that we're either going to check male or female. That's not a reality for everyone. And some of us get comf uncomfortable when people want to challenge that notion of other or transgender. However, my argument is it's, it's still a lived psychological experience for a vast number of people. But we don't think about it, we don't have to, because if you are so comfortable with either choosing ma masculine, male, feminine, female, boy, girl, um, you don't realize that state of discomfort for those people who don't get recognized or have to kind of find a way into the conversation. Um, so, so we're going to talk more about that. All right, so I want to give you some working definitions of sexual identity. All right, so there are so many dimensions to sexuality and what I want to call sexual identities. Generally, when we hear this word, and it's just a working definition, but it's most commonly understood this way, as a umbrella and a, ca a categorical word for two spheres of our sexual development. One sphere is gender. And another sphere is sexual, and I'm going to abbreviate, orientation. Okay, so it's important to understand that these are distinct processes and phenomena. They are distinct psychological um, experiences and um, sexual development um, elements of our sexual identity. Um, gender is about uh, words like masculine, feminine, and I'm going to go on from there, and this is about um, who your erotic um, proclivity, wh where your erotic proclivities takes you to when you want romance and er eroticism. So it's with whom do you like to share your sexuality? That's sexual orientation. Now I'm going to backtrack just a second here. I also want you to bear in mind the distinction between sex and gender. All right, so think of sex as our biology, our genitalia, our hormones, our, our brain chemistry. Sex, physiological, brain chemistry, um, what our body looks like. Think of this as sex. Um, in, in the physical form, and gender is self, uh, self identity. How one perceives oneself in the body that they were given. How they perceive themselves in the body 
that they were given. These are both separate, but they impact each other. The biochemistry that goes on in utero during sex differentiation, when that zygote starts uh, developing more and more, it sends signals having to do with hormones, brain chemicals, um, sex hormones that will trigger the body to develop certain physical sexual reproductive traits that are physical. Um, but it also kind of shapes how our personality, our brain is constructed about how we relate to our own body. So does that, is that making some sense? All right, so they're separate, but they in, uh, interact, they intersect. Gender, as you probably know, it's been a, a real upfront conversation in the last five or so years. Gender goes beyond masculinity and femininity. Those are perceptions of what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman. But also, gender involves a category called a gender. These are individuals who don't perceive themselves as one or the other. They perceive themselves as an individual. They do not use gender, a social construction. They don't use that as a signifier for who they are. That goes against the grain of our social construction. Because as soon as somebody walks in the, in, into the room, you register, are they male, are they female? You register that. And you put meaning onto that. So that's the social construction element as well. When I walk into this room, you're not going to make an association with me because I have hazel eyes. But you will make associations of me because of my female looking body. You'll have assumptions, perceptions, ideas. That's just how the brain works. That's another lecture. So, that, so, so the body and the way I present myself in this female body um, is, is clearly um, a reflection of how I move between my sex and my gender. And it's signified very much in my life. I don't wake up in the morning. I never think of myself as not a woman. But I rarely think about the impact of my hazel eyes. Nor does society. It's not a so eye color is not a social construction. It's just we look at blue, hazel, whatever, and we just notice. But when it's in a body and it's it's expressing itself, we impose meaning. What should and shouldn't happen. You would not appreciate, and I know you wouldn't if, this, if I were in a male body, but you'd think differently if you saw me on the street and I spit in this body, if I really just went off and spit. Um, it's not what women are supposed to do. Uh, there are all these rules and expectations associated with how you're supposed to perform. But there are people who in the millennial generation who say, I don't want to buy into that. I'm just a person. I'm just a person. I feel no more masculine, feminine. I don't want to use that. It just feels natural to just be a person. That's a gender. That's a gender. They may not use this word. They may not um, explain it to you, but there are individuals who clearly feel that way. As opposed to, and we're going to go back and forth here, as opposed to somebody who is asexual. Asexual. So what do you think this means? They, they have no sexual inclination. No, they have no sexual inclination. They have none. They have none. They don't have uh, a need, although they have the physiological capacities to get erect, to feel aroused, 
but they have no inner sense to express this in the way they uh, engage in love and romance. Mm -hmm. And now, in the last five or so years, we're hearing the millennials come up with more words, like I'm demisexual. These are people who say, you know, when I look at or watch, nothing, nothing compels me to do anything erotic with myself or another. I'm not interested in masturbating, no. But, these people say, but when I fall in love, when I feel a connection, um, I like some sex some of the time. That makes them demi, or some people say asexual light, because they have some sexual expression. Asexuals will sometimes, and it's fluid, remember sexual identities, asexuals may masturbate, they may not. They may cuddle, they may not. They may engage in sex play with a partner for their partner's satisfaction and they want to they love that person but they don't want to engage in it for themselves so this is about doing and feeling eroticism and this is about how you uh, express your body and we expect people to do that in masculine ways or feminine ways right we also know, though, and this word may be a little bit more familiar to you, we also know that lots of people, lots of people engage in androgyny. How many of you have heard this word before? Okay, so, um, who, who want to just think out loud for a definition? Not exactly, not exactly. What you're talking about is something else we're, we're, we'll get to. It's intersexual. Okay, so let's go back to androgyny. This is a recognition of the body that you have as male or female. For example, I consider myself an androgynous female because what makes me androgynous is I'm not so traditionally female in how I think women should be or act. Now, I, I'm not a spitter, but, you know, I'm loud. I can be loud. I can be tough. I really can be tough when I go to New York. Um, and it's acting outside the tradition of what the social construction says is feminine. Because I've crossed over into masculinity, it makes me androgynous. I am not confused about my femininity. I do not want to be a man. But my behaviors and my self-concept about my own femininity is not pink and frilly. So androgyny was a term used by a developmental psychologist in the early 70s who did her dissertation, I believe, on this test that's been um, replicated um, where she asked people to describe themselves and she came up with a list of adjectives that sounded masculine and feminine. And some of those words having masculine energy or sensibility to it and femininity to it they meant the same thing. And what she found in brief was that the majority of people, and she had a, a good sample, the majority of the people don't know this word, but they're androgynous. So I like to talk about my colleague, um, Don Norton, very androgynous. Now you wouldn't know that by looking at him. If you spend time with him, you might see that he does cry. He, he's just not tied to the traditional role that society constructs. That's androgyny. Okay, questions or clarifications or anything about that? Why do you think that some use for, you know, somebody who looks a certain way? 
Yeah, because androgyny could be an expression of the inside emotions that are untraditional for men. So it could be within, I'm going to abbreviate, or it could be an expressive outward. So we are seeing more uh, attention paid to androgynous models where you can't tell physically if they're masculine or feminine. Androgynous, yes, yes, that's right. David Bowie is a great example. Um, he appears very fluid, masculine, feminine in his appearance. Now, I don't know how he self-identified, rest his soul. I don't know how he self-identified, but just on appearance, David Bowie is clearly androgynous in this definition, whereas Don Norton, you wouldn't know. Okay, good. So, gender, sexual orientation. So we are going from androgyny to now intersexual. So the, this word is often, often, often misunderstood to believe that it is referring to people with mixed genitals. N no, it may, but it's not based on that. It's based on an expression, either within or without, that you are fluid. Intersexuals are biologically, um, and this is where we're emphasizing sex, have some combination of masculinity and femininity in their biology. So we use those words, masculine and feminine, masculinity and femininity, to express what's going on in their body. Remember, that's a framework that we've been operating on forever, you know, 2,000 two years ago. And uh, their biology shows some sort of, their actual physical biology shows some representation of maleness, femaleness. So um, you, you may recall, maybe many of you won't, in 1986, the Spain hurdler in the Olympics, Maria Patina, was getting ready for her trial. Um, she had to take a sex test. Not a big deal. She's been, you know, just going through the motions all along. So they, she took the sex test, and Maria Patina found out that she is not a she, chromosomally. That Maria Patina has an X and a Y not an X and an X. However, Maria Patina, not knowing her chromosomal structure, not having periods because she has low body fat, it never occurred to her that embedded within her labia are a pair of testes, that she doesn't have ovaries, that she has a vaginal canal, she doesn't have a uterus, she would no, have no way of knowing that. So there are variations of intersexuals like that. Embedded, uh, people who look female and they have embedded testes in their labia. Or uh, people who look female and they have a micro penis or an extra large clitoris. Because essentially clitorises and penises are operating in the same way and of the same body tissue and structure. So intersexuals can look a variety of ways. There's a local artist who gave a talk uh, fairly a while ago, um, a, a photographer, who uh, is not, it's not readily available unless you really look, but this particular person, they identify in their gender their gender as they, not him or her. Um, and this person has one developed breast. There's all kinds of ways our bodies can become, and look, I should say, intersexual. Now, this is sex, but let's talk about the gender of intersexuals. Some will feel very masculine. Some will feel very feminine. Some will feel androgynous in their gender. 
Maria Patina still feels like a female even though she's got an XX and testes embedded in her labia. She still feels female. Now who are we to say whether she is or isn't? And this is when we see the holes in our standard social construction. What makes a woman a woman? When we've been using categories like XX, XY, uterus, uh, Bartholin's glands, Cowper's glands for men, as the criteria, it doesn't hold up necessarily in terms of how they see themselves. What makes a woman a woman is because she says so. And what makes a man a man is because he thinks so. So intersexuals may be in the traditional realm, masculine, feminine. They may be androgynous, as I said, or they may say, I'm a little bit of both and I like it that way. And their third, sometimes used third, um, gender. And sometimes it's mixed with third sex. This is where it becomes interchangeable depending on who you're talking to. These are people who say, and in a way it also reflects an extreme androgynous person who says, I, I or an, um, an agender person, I'm, um, I'm a little bit of both and I like it that way. I don't, I don't want to be confined. Make sense? Okay. There's a lot more to this, um, but because of time, I'm going to move forward for now. Let me just see if there's anything. Let me, let me do one more thing, um, because I, I do want to have you feel free to ask questions for clarity. Um, Um, pansexual and and transgendered. This term is another umbrella term and this is used um, sometimes in different ways like gender queer. Queer not meaning about sexual orientation, but just different. Anything that is not cisgender, or what we think of traditionally masculine and feminine. So transgendered folks know that they were born in this body. Let's say me, I'm born in this female body, I'm un and let's say I'm uncomfortable with it, and I don't identify as female. So I may bind my breasts, I might get top surgery to take my breasts away. I might have sex reassignment surgery. When I alter physically my body, I, I enter into this sphere of transgendered. And once, the, uh, once I start taking hormones, once I change my, um, let's say I change my clitoris and somehow because of the uh, testosterone I'm, I'm taking, it grows. Um, it's changing my sex too because it's hormonal based. So some transgendered people move here because of hormone surgery and some say, well, I'm gonna get a breast job. Let's say a, a, a male to a female, I'm gonna get breasts. I'm gonna keep my penis. I'm gonna use the word Z instead of she, busting out of that language construction. And yes, we think that males should have penises, and yet, here I am. Um, I've got breasts, um, and I have a penis, and that penis does not define my sex or my gender. How are you doing with this? Interesting? Yes. Um, Anne Fausto Sterling is a biologist and she wrote about 
transgenderism. And she really I identified this concept called social genitals. And it reflects the social construction of what you're supposed to be like and act and feel if you have a penis, and what you're supposed to be like, act like, and feel if you have a vagina or vulva. She calls the penis social genitals because just like when you came, saw me for the first time in this room, you registered female and you assigned me with the social constructions of expectations, rules, and roles that you think I should have because of my body. So social genitals will, in this example, are referring to the penis. That is not just a belly button. We just you know, just like our eye color, we don't have a lot of social construction around belly button. We might around what it's supposed to look like and what's pretty and what's not, but we don't have a lot of signifiers around belly button. But we do when it comes to sexual anatomy. Okay, so um, transgendered. Pansexual. Unlike bisexuals, Bisexual people are attracted to either bodies that look like masculine or feminine. They're attracted to both, masculine or feminine. Pansexual people fall in love with the person, regardless of their body. So they may be third gender or, or in some way transgendered. They just fall in love with the person and that makes them pansexual because they have a capacity to love outside of this construction of what's who's sexy, what romance looks like and with what who body whose body. Any questions? Pansexual individuals go beyond their erotic partners being just masculine looking and feminine looking. They fall in love with whoever that person is regardless of their body, sex, appearance. No, 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 they are. They are. Unlike asexuals, these folks are really into, um, they're, they're not major um, sex fiends. Th this has nothing to do with their libido. It's just that they, ha they express and they, have a des they express their libido and they have a desire to act on their libido when it comes to sex, pleasuring, romance, and love. And who they share that with can be in any body. Hard to know, hard to know, because there's not been past census records. There's not been language to self-identify. There's not been social acceptance to express oneself. So we don't know. And it, you know, there's no real pat answer other than a guess um, that somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 percent, which is a lot when you look at the human population of people, are in some way non-traditional in their sexual orientation and in their gender. Yes, but on their birth certificate they would say it's a boy. Mm -hmm. We we didn't track Intersexuals. That's exactly right. And the problem with that, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I'm, I really appreciate that you brought it up, is this is changing in medical practices in, within the pediatrics world um, just very recently. The problem with assigning a a baby who has a micro penis, let's say, 
and they um, feel that that baby looks too masculine and so they they don't do anything until puberty and they just start raising this baby with a micro penis who has let's say XX as um, a boy the problem with that is is that when that child who starts identifying their own gender about 18 months could be saying but I'm a girl and you just you know why am I taking these hormones at age 15 or 14 um, why are you dressing me like this because that's not how I feel and so babies can't speak for their gender gender is a developed concept in in any particular society that we commonly used as masculine and feminine and uh, it becomes recognized within that child as early as 18 months their sexual orientation on the other hand may not be not may not come to their awareness until they're 18 this is about how they see themselves an 18 month old kid can say that's a girl that's a boy mommy's a girl I'm a girl they start recognizing these social constructions that young and we'll see that in intersexed and transgender children. All right, so let's let's move to the margins. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Patty. Sure. Asexual people may or may not have love and romance in their life. They may have some sex, but they generally don't express or feel a need to express sex as pleasuring or as pleasurable or as a romantic gesture or a love gesture. There's, there's no, um, there's an ability, it's, they have the hormones for it, um, we haven't detected a, a, a gene, but they, they have no need to express their sexuality. It's just not that black and white because as I said demisexual people some will say um, not nothing 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 until I'm in love and then that might change. So there's just so much fluidity. It is really impossible to know but we're going to guess that there's an intersection between the two because we know there there is in the birthing process the sex differentiation process um, and as we come out of the womb hormones are impacting us in various ways mm -hmm. okay so let me switch gears and um, th this is right on time here we go this is a loud noise again and this should come on slowly but I want to talk about um, cultures that go beyond the binary and I'm not going to say a whole lot about them but their social construction of sexuality, sexual identity is very different than the U.S.'s. So um, we see gender flu. I've just chosen four examples, but we see gender fluidity throughout civilizations, and this is one in particular in Japan. Um, these are men, feminized, portraying females, and that is partly sometimes done for entertainment reasons, sometimes it's done for love, it's an attraction, sometimes it's done because it's how the person feels about their body as a male, as, a, um, as being born a male, that their form of masculinity for, for, for these individuals, these third genders, uh, have an organic sense that femininity, as we've called it, is a truer expression of their masculinity. 
So sometimes these people are saying, I'm a he, and sometimes, sometimes, if we could go back, we might, we might hear somebody say, no, I'm a her. Now this is modern, and this is how language cons confines us. I'm a her. Um, so in, in Japan, we see this in ancient times and, um, and today. Um, in India, there are lots of terms used by Bengals and Bengalis and I can't think of the other um, subculture within India. Um, that he, I'm more, most familiar with the use of hijras. These are men born as men. Um, perhaps they're intersexual, there's no record. But they look masculine, and they, there is a language to define them as a third gender. Hijra is one. In Indian culture, they are seen by many, not all, especially as modern culture and Western society um, imposes itself on the rest of the world. But they are, they've been given a role of, um, of um, wise person because they see both sides. Uh, they bring good luck during um, uh, um, baby showers and weddings. They've not always been cast aside and targeted. Some of them are eunuchs, some of them are not, but they present themselves in this feminine way. Um, in indigenous peoples you know, on this continent, uh, sometimes the word is used two-spirited. They are understood by some, again, but not by all, as having sacred power, embracing multiple perspectives and sensibilities. Um, they're holy, sacred. And the Fa'afini in Samoa. Um, and I wanted to particularly show you this array of expressions of Fa'afini. Here we have a very feminized, and I didn't have room, but on the slide, and I didn't want to make it too cumbersome, but I could have shown you another slide of somebody, of a Fa'afini, who's hypersexualized. Like, um, who's the blonde? Pamela Anderson? You know, really hypersexualized in the way she expresses her femininity. And the more Western the uh, influence hits Samoa, the more um, there is this expression of hyperfemininity. I would not call this hyperfemininity, but definitely it's a higher level of femaleness than what you see here. Fa'afini translates in Samoa as in the manner of a woman. No, oh. these are all different. No, you're showing us the same person in different. No. All different expressions and all different people. Okay. Yeah. Um, they hold tribal power. They hold uh, uh, council positions in, in their villages. They are respected. But then they also, just like the other third gender uh, um, societies, they also can be harassed and dismissed and um, ignored. But the very fact that in the missionary day or pre-missionary days, these words and you know in in Japan in, in the Edo period, the words reflected a reality for people, and it didn't always have a negative connotation. But as the West has imposed Adam and Eve concepts, the structure of, of gender becomes um, very rigid and, and shameful if you break beyond that. Historically, are there any instances within westernized culture where you see a, a sort of acceptance of a third gender? In the U.S.? Well, not necessarily in the U.S., I'm just thinking like um, 
you know, I find it interesting that the time period for Japan is pre-Western contact, that that third gender is so successful. Yes. And then the Tokugawa Shogun it ends, and the Maori Restoration begins, and the West comes in, and then it's not seen anymore. Yeah. Recently. Yeah. I'm wondering if within European culture, say, for instance, the Renaissance, if there were any sort of third identifying genders that may have been accepted within the Christian identity. To some extent, but not wholly, not having a place in society other than entertainment. Okay. So Shakespeare had men play, perform as women who then acted as men, and there was this fluidity there. The word homosexual didn't really come into our parlance until a hundred, about a hundred years ago. Just people were acting however they acted, and then mores, Puritan ideas, shaped what should be done about people who act beyond the rigid stereotype of heterosexual, homosexual. Um, so Fa'afini, do you, now I've shown you four cultures. Do you notice anything specific that's common to all four? They're all men looking like women. Yes. They're all men looking like women. Studies tell us there's something called andro, um, uh, sorry, autophilia, where a very common expression of femininity is found in the U.S. among heterosexual men who sometimes want to be Betty. I say Betty because there's some research or um, information based on a book called My Husband Betty, um, where she talks about, at least at that time in their life, um, Betty would sometimes appear in the bedroom. Betty knew that Betty was uh, a male, but sometimes in the bedroom wanted to be feminine. We, we hear drag queens all the time. Well, what about drag kings? They exist. If you really want to look at that, um, Google Venus Boys. And it's, uh, it's a documentary about, and boys is B-Y-B-O-Y-Z. These are women who fall somewhere in the spectrum, and either for entertainment reasons or for a sexual expression, they assert their body in masculine ways. But it is very curious to me, there is no information that's definitive, why males, why males are the more likely visible um, body that transgresses, not in a negative way, but goes beyond the boundaries that we've set for, ma for masculinity. Males do that, why? Now I have speculation, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about why is it that it appears that more people in male bodies want to experience femininity in some way, either sexually or a or, 24-7 or um, identity, or at, are fluid this way. Any thoughts about why? Patty? I would almost say that's a good question because um, in our society for women, there is such a, a big emphasis on bikinis and the, the women, you know, envy the bikinis and they want bikinis, they chase after it, and dress that way. So why is it that. Why is more men? Oh, that's oh, interesting. Why okay. But why more men? I'm not going to be um, really direct here, but our social construction of sexuality, eroticism, and it ties to sexual orientation, has a, a, a construction like this. There is a doer and the person that's getting done. Are you following? Yeah. <laughs> a top, a bottom. And there's more fluidity in female sex roles, seductress or innocent. 
males have to be, um, with quotations, have to be the doer, the knowledgeable one, the one in charge. Um, and as it relates to sexual expression slash sexual orientation, that role for many hetero and homosexual men is assumed um, and it creates a limitation. Now there are many men, heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual men, where it's not a limitation. They, they relate organically to being in this role. But it'll be interesting in 20 years from now to see if gender structure in the bedroom will shift so that that emphasis of being the doer is uh, more fluid for men. It does mean that women do have more fluid sexuality ability to express themselves in a way that is black and white, because humans are not. Uh, and women benefit from that in a lot of ways. Yeah, and there's also things that spills over into our emotional expression. So as in women are able to talk about their language of emotional expression. Exactly. Men aren't allowed to cry over certain things. Yes. Oh, your mother does. You can cry about that. But don't cry over this. You're a man. You're not supposed to do that. Exactly. So maybe that desire also spreads into that and that we have to express things like emotionally. Yeah. Addressing that or changing genders. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't want to go too far into this because it's, it's a little, it's off topic a bit, but just think of it, you know, I, um, it's, no, I don't even need to go there. <laughs> no. So you can see that, that choice of expression and that tr authentic self has more paths to go for women. In another way, in another way. Now we don't use the word slut in the same way for men as we do for women. There is, and uh, so there's a freedom for men to be more active, and there's a freedom for women to be more um, expressive. I'd like to show you this video clip. Uh, this is a TED talk, and. Um, it's cut off of in the beginning, and that's not important, and you're not going to see any visuals except words in the very beginning. But after about a minute, you're going to hear the person behind the, the dialogue. OK, so what were you saying about your book? Why are you writing your book? I'm writing my book because for all of the things that my parents got wrong, you know, drugs, being absent, there being no electricity sometimes, not a lot of food involved, showbiz is way more important than school, blah, 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 blah. The one thing that they always got unequivocally right was that they accepted me for who I said that I was. And that gives a kid a sense of self-esteem and self-respect. It equips you to survive anything. I'm writing my book because of that, to try to like sneak in via the drama door and be like, actually, the real message is to accept your children and accept your friends and accept people for who the, they say that they are. When I was six, I decided that I wanted to be a boy. We were in the park one day and there were these kids playing soccer, a bunch of boys, and I wanted to play with them, and they, soccer, football, and they wouldn't let me play. And they were like, are you a boy or a girl? And I was like, I'm a girl? And they were like, nah, you can't play. And I was basically like, that. I'm a boy, can I play now? Because I can play better than you, And uh, I went with my dad and I just, was like, hey, I want to be a boy from now on. And then it kind of developed and started from there. And then I lived as a boy for eight years, from six to 14. Kind of everybody in my family was like, we didn't see you as a girl or a boy. We just saw you as Io. There was no notion of like gender dysmorphia or whatever. I was born on Third Street in the Bowery, and my parents were all up in the like 
no way of movement and drag culture. So everybody around them was inventing their identities all the time. The idea that their kid would invent her identity wasn't strange to them. Can you take off your gloves? Yes. It was a really stressful experience because there was the reality that I was living and then there was all the navigation of what that meant to other people. Going to take a piss was a problem, always. I would only use the boys' bathroom, but I would wait until people were out of it so that in case somebody peeked under the stall, they weren't gonna see my feet or like maybe they'd look through the one inch. I was like real neurotic at the same time as totally breaking all of the rules. So I developed the skill of not ever having to pee. And that is still something that I'm like, do I have to pee? I had library cards under boys' names. Like, it was a full immersive experience. What happened, like, in terms of peers and, and what, what, what? I didn't have any friends. I had one friend, and she was from the South Bronx. When I was, like, 11, I went over to her house one night, and there was another girl there who had a crush on me and I had a shaved head and like presented fully as a boy. I never thought about being gay, it wasn't a sexual kid, like it wasn't about that at all. It was my identity. This girl was like, yo, why aren't you hollering at me? I wanna holler at you, why aren't you trying to kick it to me? And I was like, what? And she was like, why aren't you trying to kick it to me? And I was like, I'm not, oh, no, it, it's, I'm, it's not like that. And I couldn't explain why she didn't want to have a crush on me because at the time, the idea of being gay was so far beyond. And then her discovering that I actually had a vagina was like even further beyond what an 11 year old mind can comprehend. And I was just like, you don't want to get involved with me. And then she was like, I'm sleeping in the bunk above you. I'm gonna get you later. And I was like, ah, no. What happened when you were 13? You were about to say. Um, when I was 13, I moved to Germany. My dad lived there. I went to this school for foreigners that was like Albanian kids and Turkish kids and uh, this one Greek girl who was my first real crush. These two Russian girls were like the hot girls in class and I was totally oblivious to them. And they also were like, yo, why are you not, what's going on here? Why are you not trying to holler at us like every other boy in the class? and I just wasn't interested. And then they both had a crush on me because of that. And at that point I was like, I'm sick of this. I don't wanna lie to people anymore. Like this sucks. And so I switched schools. And when I switched schools the summer that I was turning 14, I remember I was biking down the street and I saw my dad and I was like, hey, I think I wanna grow my hair out. I think I wanna be a girl. And he was like, okay. I had like a whole gender revelation a couple months ago where I was like, I think I'm a man on the inside. Like, I, I know what my body is and I'm clear on what my genitalia is, but I'm also fairly clear on the fact that like, if the distinction between gender uh, bending or rule breaking gender wise and transgenderism is that is how you feel on the inside, that I'm transgender because I feel like a man on the inside, but yet because of the way that I was raised and never forced into dresses and all of that, I don't have the narrative that apparently goes with being transgender where you hate your body. I don't hate my body at all. So it's, I don't fit that box either, you know? But I never fit any box. I'm like the ultimate unicorn and it's weird and lonely, but I've been doing a project called Self-Evident Truths and uh, I've been traveling the United States photographing anybody who identifies as anything other than 100% straight to humanize what that community looks like for people that think that they don't know any gay people. And then when I have 10,000 portraits, I'm gonna go to the Washington Monument and lay them all out on the National Mall and stage a big march on Washington. The aim of it is to create more empathy by, via familiarity. We're not some like marginalized freak show. The most incredible byproduct of this thing that I'm passionate about is having kids say, I feel better about myself, I feel more comfortable with myself, like it's the best feeling on earth. And I'm taking a break right now to write my book, but next summer I'm gonna do the last 1500 and then hopefully the spring right before the next presidential election will be on the Washington Monument. So 14, what happened at 14? I switched to a new school in this small town in Germany and I looked like a boy. So I came into class and they were like, 
this is your new, well, because in German it's the Schüler, which is student, male student, or Schülerin, which is female student. And they were like, this is the new Schülerin in class. And they were all like, Schüler. And she was like, nah, Schülerin. And all the kids were just like, what? So then it kind of, that was me standing in front of the class and everybody getting the full dunk right away. And I was just like, yeah, I'm a girl. What do you want to do about it? <laughs> I mean, what are you going to say, you know? I mean, now, looking back, I wonder if I switched genders back so that I could have a normal social life. Because coming out of such an extreme situation, I wanted to have some sense of normalcy. At the end of that year, I got kicked out of that school, and so they found this boarding school for me in England that was started by this Indian philosopher, Krishnamurti, and it was supposed to be about questioning and openness and freedom and I thought great questioning means questioning the rules it's questioning yourself but I didn't figure that out until I got in a lot of fights with a lot of teachers I got sent to this place that was like a mansion on a hill in the middle of nowhere I had cornrows because my hair was grown out and it was a challenge because I looked like a boy but I was sleeping in the girls wing obviously in the dorms of the school and Within two weeks, my best friend, who was, she was 19 and she was like the hottest girl in school. Um, she became my best friend because she was depressed that her boyfriend was so far away. And I was like, yo, come on, I'll charm you with my New Yorkness. Like, come on, let's be friends. And I made her laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh until we started telling each other stories about our lives and we'd stay up all night. And like, one day, she was German. She was like, I, uh, I think I know why we cannot leave each other to go to class. I was like, why? She's like, because we are in love. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, I just switched back to being a girl and I gotta be a gay girl too. Like, what? And I was like, hold up, let me think about this. Just kidding, let's go. <laughs> and we were like stupid smacked in love. She was the first person to show me what a shower was. She was, I was raised a feral child. I was. Mowgli like she showed me how to shave my legs. She showed me what deodorant was. She showed me my body You know, we had sex for the first time and she was like You're beautiful and I had never heard that Also partially because I if you told me I was beautiful as a little boy I would have punched you in the nuts and we were together on and off for four years mm. Yeah, I got kicked out of that school. I went back to New York I don't know, people were tougher back then. People are such pansies now in their differentness because they don't have to work for it. Nobody has to fight anybody. Nobody has to stand up for anything. They want to be queer and pansexual and demi-romantic and whatever the f but they don't want anybody to challenge them or question them about it. It's so complicated for me because on the one hand, everything that I'm fighting for is that you accept people for who they say that they are and you treat people with dignity and respect. On the other hand, this whole culture of language policing and like, Everything has to be PC and everything has to be homogenized is sickening to me. Like everything about gay culture that I love and everything about New York that I love is built from people having to push back against people trying to oppress them. When we refer to brainwashing or we refer to the machine, it's as if there is this big spaceship filled with the people pushing buttons and controlling things, and everybody else is the minions. But the truth of the matter is, the machine is perpetuated every day by every girl sitting at a desk who turns around and looks at her coworker and goes, oh, what's that? What are you wearing? What are you, why are you doing that? Oh, go get your bush waxed. Oh, like, do your eyebrows. You're not just a sheep. When you make other people feel less than for not participating, then you have become the machine. I say, do whatever you want to make yourself feel good. If you feel like you need that Birkin bag, get the Birkin bag. You have your own voyage to discover what makes you feel good and like whatever that is, that's your business. But when you put that shit on other people, then you become the machine. Can you elaborate now on, on what you were saying in the last six months that you feel more, that you feel inside like a man? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean exactly? I was having this conversation with my uh, project manager for the project, it's for Self Evident, and um, he's like 6'3 and broad and hairy and always wears nail polish. And I was like, what if I'm a man? And he was like, look, I mean, the difference is 
I may wear nail polish. I can wear makeup sometimes. I'll occasionally be known to put on a dress. But when I go to sleep at night, I'm a man. And I love being a man. And I'm in my body. And I love that. It's down to how you see yourself. And I was like, oh, well, then I'm a man. The line for me is that I don't want to change my mind, my, my mental chemistry. I don't want to change my emotionality. And if hormones are going to do that, then I don't want to do that. If I could just snap my fingers and tomorrow have a man's body, I would do it. I guess in my own head, I've always thought of transgenderism as like a, a physical in-between place. And I'm really, really, really learning to understand the emotional in-between place. But then that begs the whole question, what is a man? And what is a woman? And how much of that is societal bullshit anyway? So why would I have to change my body to fit somebody else, like another norm? None of the labels fit me. None. When do you feel um, the most vulnerable? I used to feel the most vulnerable when I had to go to the bathroom in public. And now I'm kind of like, whichever one's open, I'm going to go in. I go in the women's bathroom, I'm like standing up straighter and like more smiley and more like girly. And then if I go in the men's bathroom, I'm sure hunched over and like trying to keep my head down and just like be in and be out. On the one hand, everybody in there is just trying to take a piss. This is not like a big political theater stage, you know? Like I don't need to get into a big debate with people about the politics of gender in the bathroom every time I go to take a piss. That being said, changing my behavior to suit the system. I don't know. There's no time of the day if I'm in public where there isn't somebody trying to figure out what I am. And that's exhausting. So, fluidity, right? Comments, questions? Very fluid. I'm going to guess maybe early 30s. Yes. Patty? I think Dramatic effect. <laughs> <laughs> She's a performance artist and photographer and Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes, she chose not to. She didn't buy into the social genitals, but she said if she, if it could happen just like that. Right, and, and yet, yeah, and notice though, we did not see her bind her breasts, which is a very unhealthy thing to do, by the way. No, she, she had a covering of her breasts, not just as a, a covering, but a feminine covering. She didn't wear, you know, a tank top, that could have been androgynous. She wore a bra-looking thing. So she feels like a man on the inside, and yet. That's right, Eva. It's very interesting. And what you're highlighting is the ways in which we navigate 
and negotiate the layers of our own identity, whether it's gender, ethnicity, religion. We do that a lot and we don't realize it. But if you're in the other, you, you, know, you know an intimacy about that experience more than somebody who doesn't have to think about code switching. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So I, I hope that I live long enough to see if there'll be shifts, not because uh, in our society, not because I think there should be, but because I think there's cr some critical mass building around rigidity or, um, in sexual identity. I think that's shifting more and more. I mean, uh, the, the transgender revolution was announced in the early 90s and, and earlier, but really started to have some gravitas in the 90s and more and more. And it's not shifted enough yet. We still have laws that don't allow transgender people to use um, their, their recognized sex stall um, in schools. I like to think it's changing. I think, I mean, at least here in California, it's kind of just going. And on this campus. Yeah. Because we have unisex restrooms. But of course, I was just traveling. And what was the name? What's the name? The name of the Santa Fe? I don't know where you were. So. I'm trying to think. Of, well, <laughs> you fly out of Santa Fe a lot. So I thought maybe you'd been in a state. They don't say you know, kind of just what they said. And our city is going to. Something like anyone can use them. Something. It's, it's kind of a. Yeah. And our city council is adopting, or is bound to adopt a, within businesses, the, the policy of having a unisex bathroom. Sorry, this is Rio They didn't say unisex, though. Yeah, some will use that, some will use um, um, all you know, some will have really be progressive and have the various gender signs. Bye, Daddy. Good to see you. Thank you, David. Yeah. You're welcome. That's very interesting. I think it's, um, I was just thinking as you were writing all those things on there, that there's so much fluidity, as you were saying. Like, I think that when you were talking about androgyny, I feel like most people mm -hmm. are are somewhere in that range. Like, I think it would be hard to find anybody who's like, I'm just 100%, 100%, that most people are somewhere in the middle. Yes, that's true with androgyny. And that's also true with sexual orientation. That in some way along the, in somewhere along the lines, every human has done either fantasy or behavior um, where they transgress the label that they use for themselves as hetero. So in other words, this is, that was a complicated way of saying, in some point in their life, most humans are not here, hetero or homo. They're in here, most humans. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>